A very good morning to everyone. Um, welcome to Chacha 2021. And today's session, where we're going to be talking about hygiene and infection prevention, bringing back this critical missing ingredient into primary health care. Welcome, everyone. I'm Dr. Arundhati Murlitharan. I work with WaterAid India, and I'm delighted today to be joined by several eminent speakers um, who are well known in the sphere of healthcare as well uh, as on wash in healthcare facilities. Um, we have with us today Dr. Sen Rashid, uh, Mr. Job Zakaria, uh, Dr. Deepak Saxena, um, uh, we and uh, um, Mr. V. R. Raman. So welcome to everyone. Um, I'm going to start off today's uh, session by providing a little bit of an overview as to why it's critical for us to be looking at hygiene and infection prevention uh, in the context of healthcare with a very specific focus on um, primary healthcare. Um, so I'm just going to start a presentation. Give me a moment, please. Okay. So um, the reason why I got interested in this particular issue uh, is because many years ago, about 20 years ago, I remember walking into a, into a large hospital. It was a tertiary care hospital, a public hospital, working uh, as a social worker in a maternity ward. Um, and I remember walking into a labor and delivery room where there were four tables, just regular steel table stretchers that were out there with three women who were in varying stages of labor um, uh, preparing to give birth. Um, the tables were fairly unclean. There was dry blood from previous deliveries that had been conducted. There were very harassed, very busy nurses, as well as one doctor who was assisting all three deliveries at the same time. Um, apart from just being taken aback at the particular scene, later on I realized that there was also a doctor and nurses who did not have any gloves or any other kind of protective equipment as they were assisting in these deliveries, in addition to fairly unhygienic conditions. Fast forward about 15 years uh, to about 2015, and I saw a very similar scene in another large public hospital, which was known uh, for having a record high number of deliveries. This time, again, delivery beds stained in blood. Um, there were discarded syringes, as well as other medical equipment that were lying, waiting to be cleaned, waiting to be sterilized. There were also large rodents that were roaming around in a delivery ward. Babies being, newborn babies being wrapped in old cloth. Um, so clearly, um, the issue of hygiene and infection prevention is very, very uh, important for us in India, where we do see some of the highest rates of maternal mortality as well as neonatal mortality in the country. India has made significant strides, significant improvements. Um, We've strengthened our health system. We are definitely moving towards uh, inching and definitely moving towards universal health care as well as health for all. But there a lot remains to be done. Now, while we are addressing this issue on various fronts, um, today we want to dig a little deeper into how can we bring focus back onto hygiene and infection prevention as critical actions that need to be taken, um, especially uh, in the context of primary uh, health care. So just a little bit of background of what we see in India. So in India, we actually have one of some other we have, a, we have a fantastic kind of structure in terms of our public health system. We have over 30,000 primary health care centers. The government is also making important critical investments in health and wellness centers uh, as well. And we also have a number of community health centers. Now, these are closest to our communities, urban and rural, um, and also support in providing basic health care services, including uh, deliveries. Um, and care for mothers and their newborns. Um, and in the context of COVID, these centers also may play a critical role in COVID prevention, vaccinations, uh, as well as testing. Now, um, 
some of these statistics to those who are working in the field of public health in India are not new. We have made uh, improvements in terms of our neonatal mortality, maternal mortality. Um, but as you can see from the numbers, we still have a way to go before we're able to achieve our SDG targets against these particular critical indicators for India's health and development. Um, what we see also in the data is sepsis, uh, is, uh, which is an infection, is also a leading cause of infection, mortality, uh, amongst mothers and amongst babies and it's critical for us to begin to take action and that's where hygiene attention to water sanitation uh, comes in in the context of healthcare. Now, um, the Joint Monitoring Program of UNICEF and WHO talks about basic services uh, for healthcare. So they have a ladder uh, of these basic services. Now, the picture that you can see here is actually of a PHC that was taken uh, a few years ago. This is a delivery uh, room in a in a PHC. There's a sink there. Um, unfortunately, the tap did not have drinking, uh, did not have running water, and the soap bit that was left over was just a small bit of soap. It has a neonatal bed and on the other side which you cannot see was the uh, was the delivery bed for um for delivering women now um what we see here is again the statistics uh, which have been late, reported in the latest gmp report for healthcare facilities for india actually show fairly good numbers. We have 94% of healthcare facilities that have basic water service. That's pretty good in a country which is struggling uh, with acute water shortage in many parts. Now, while that is basic water service, we also need to be cognizant of the fact that um, is this water available throughout the day and throughout the year in sufficient quantities and uh, safe water in these healthcare facilities. Now, 89% of rural hospitals have improved sanitation facilities. Um, however, we also need to make sure that uh, uh, sanitation facilities that are linked with, say, a labor and delivery room, as well as other um, uh, wards and other aspects of the healthcare facilities, have adequate sanitation facilities that are kept clean, that enable um, our patients, as well as healthcare providers, to use them safely. Now, 99% of healthcare facilities have hand washing facilities at point of care. But again, the issue of functionality, meaning whether there is water supply, soap, or alcohol based hand rubs that allows healthcare providers and carers of patients to be able to maintain the adequate number or adequate uh, hand hygiene is critical. 80% of our healthcare facilities segregate biomedical waste that's generated, and 94% are able to treat their waste. But again, we need to see how efficiently this is being done. Um, now, 74%, which is quite high, have protocols for cleaning, and 92% of healthcare facilities have found that um, there is also training on cleaning that is provided to staff who are doing the cleaning. Now, these numbers are very promising, but the ground realities may vary across states, within districts, and also across types of healthcare facilities. Typically, uh, we see that district hospitals, which are tertiary care units, receive a fair bit of attention, fair bit of investment, given the caseload that they receive and the number of healthcare services that they provide. However, we also need to kind of shift our attention towards our sub-centers, our primary health centers, as well as our community health centers, as these are most closely located to our communities and ideally should serve as their primary point of care. And that's why we want to drive attention to today's conversation with our experts onto this particular area. Now, a good way for us to be looking at the integration of water, sanitation, hygiene, and infection prevention um, into healthcare facilities is to look at it from the health system's building block. WASH is not, cannot, and should not be seen as independent of the health system. It's very much an integral part of the health system. And if we look at the WHO health system's building blocks, where we see leadership and government, uh, governance, healthcare financing, the critical health workforce, which includes doctors, nurses, and others who are in who are engaged in healthcare delivery and administration, information and research, service delivery, as well as various types of technologies that are required, water, sanitation, hygiene, infection prevention are very important components under each of these building blocks. They improve access to healthcare services, they improve coverage of who, the, who we're all were able to reach, and very critically, it's important for ensuring quality healthcare as well as safety for all those who are engaged in this process. 
Now, again, um, I want to bring our attention back to this particular photograph at the back. Again, something that we took from one of our own fieldwork areas uh, about five years ago that shows a toilet uh, facility and a drinking water facility that was located just about two meters from the labor and delivery ward in a public, uh, in a PHC. Now here is a, a toilet, there is a hand washing station, as well as a water uh, dispensing, a drinking water dispensing filter that's here. And um, this picture itself speaks to itself, uh, speaks to all of us uh, as to the improvements that we need to make here. Now, um, recently, earlier uh, this year, uh, there was a paper that was released that was looking at estimating the cost of wash, wash interventions in healthcare facilities in India. And the critical findings that kind of pulled together data as well as the kind of investments that were made showed that the most costly interventions were on water services and sanitation because this involved actually bringing in pipe water systems, establishing water storage, engaging in, say, water purification services, as well as actually building of toilets uh, and the entire toilet technology. So it was a heavy kind of infrastructure investment. But the least costly interventions were found to be on hand hygiene and environmental surface cleaning. So very clearly indicating that, yes, we need investments on all aspects of water sanitation and hygiene. But we also see that you know even limited investments on hygiene and on infection prevention, such as environmental cleaning, can yield fairly high benefits um, for uh, those who are accessing and seeking care. So with this background, um, I would like uh, to take this opportunity to begin a rich discussion with our eminent panel of speakers. I'm going to quickly introduce them. So today um, we have with us uh, Dr. Richard Hussain from uh, the World Health Organization from the Seattle region. Uh, Dr. Hussain was the former Minister of State uh, of Health in the Maldives uh, prior to his appointment as a position of Regional Advisor for Water, Sanitation, Hygiene and Climate Change at World Health Organization. He has over 20 years of extremely rich experience in public health and wash related work with the government, UNICEF and WHO. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Hassan, and thank you for joining us. Um, we also have with us today Mr. Job Zakaria, who is currently Chief uh, of UNICEF Field Office in Chhattisgarh. In the past, Job was Director at the Department of Elementary Education at the Ministry of Human Resource Development, the Government of India. He has served as Chief of uh, UNICEF's offices in several states, including Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and Chhattisgarh. Now, um, Mr. Zakaria is a qualified chartered accountant and has an MBA uh, from UK. And at UNICEF, as the Chief of Field Officers across states, Job has always prioritized WASH uh, initiatives with a focus on hygiene and infection prevention in healthcare facilities. So we look forward to hearing from him on some of the field realities and how they've been able to catalyze action and work closely with the government. Um, we're also delighted to have Dr. Deepak Saxena, who's a physician and, and an MD in, in community medicine. And currently, he is faculty at the Indian Institute of Public Health at Gandhinagar. Um, he has a PhD in epidemiology and a postdoc in public health center from the Center of Global Health, uh, Karolinska Institute and Stockholm, Sweden. Now, um, Dr. Saxena is known for his cutting edge work that specifically focused on WASH in healthcare facilities, looking at various aspects, and he's also worked very closely and continues to work with WHO headquarters on these critical relevant aspects. Um, and lastly, uh, I'd like to also introduce Dr. Uh, Mr. V. R. Raman, who is head of policy at WaterAid India. Now, Raman has uh, donned several hats. He's been very active in the right to education sphere. He's worked as a public health professional, uh, as well as a nutrition expert, and of course, in water sanitation and hygiene. And he brings close to 30 years of experience in these diverse fields, which allows him to kind of see the connections of WASH and how it affects health, nutrition, and well being of populations across the country, urban and rural. So, we're uh, great. Uh, uh, we look forward to having a very rich discussion with all our panelists. So, I'm going to start with throwing this open to each of our speakers. I want to hear from you um, about why you think we need to kind of spotlight uh, the focus on hygiene as well as on infection prevention in healthcare facilities in India. Uh, Dr. Rashid, we'd like to start with you, please. Uh, uh, thank you. Good morning, uh, all. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers 
for inviting WHO CRO to be part of uh, this session. I'll try to uh, be brief. Uh, firstly, um, I would say that every person needs and deserves access to safe and dignified health care. Uh, not one of us seeks out health care in a hospital or clinic without clean water, a toilet and soap, the foundation for safe and dignified care. Yet uh, the absence of water, sanitation and hygiene in healthcare facilities is itself a global pandemic. Um, uh, the foundation for safe and uh, dignified care is absent in healthcare facilities around uh, the globe. WASH is an essential service and uh, without it, hundreds of thousands of healthcare facilities uh, are not centers of healing, but uh, centers of infection across uh, uh, different continents of the globe, including uh, our region, Southeast Asia. Uh, so it, it tells us how crucial and important it is. And now when we come and look at the uh, real uh, scenarios, as uh, Arundhati also uh, mentioned, mothers and newborns are among the most vulnerable. Uh, and it is very crucial and critical that we understand the whole uh, sphere of uh, the issue. In some places, uh, we see uh, case studies in whereby newborns are not named because early death is so uh, commonplace in some places. Uh, so healthcare associated infections in fragile newborns are uh, three, to, three to 20 times higher in resource li limited settings compared to more uh, high income contexts. Every year, millions of women in least developed countries uh, give birth in a facility without adequ uh, adequate wash. Um, and infections are transmitted by unwashed hands, uh, contaminated beds, unsafe water and dirty instruments used to cut umbilical cords. Uh, one day is uh, uh, normally, you know, uh, day one uh, is uh, when more than 40% of maternal and newborn deaths occur, although the majority of these deaths are, are preventable and avoidable. Uh, lack of wash endangers not only a, a those who get the service, but it endangers healthcare workers itself. Uh, the extent to which healthcare workers have died due to the lack of wash during the COVID-19 pandemic may never be fully known yet. But uh, consider the 2014 Ebola outbreak. Ebola not only killed uh, some 11,000 uh, people, uh, it was 103-fold higher in healthcare workers in Sierra Leone uh, than in general population and 42-fold higher in Guinea health workers. And in Liberia, they lost 8% of its health workforce uh, during the Ebola crisis, uh, in part because they did not have access to adequate wash. So global healthcare staff uh, addressing COVID-19 face similar challenges and threats. We will know the impact uh, a little uh, longer when we have more data and evidence on this. Um, the lack of wash endangers all patients. Uh, nearly one in six patients occurs an infection inside an healthcare facility that they did not have uh, on arrival. Hand washing alone can uh, cut deadly diarrhea disease by 45%, but not if hands cannot be washed due to uh, inadequate soap and water or if hygiene behaviors are not fully adopted. Now, lack of wash uh, discriminates against women and girls. This is uh, something very uh, important to our uh, regional context as well. Uh, findings of the landmark uh, White Ribbon Alliance uh, What Women Want survey yielded surprising results. 1.2 million women and girls from 114 countries were surveyed on their priorities for quality and reproductive and maternal health services. Wash in healthcare facilities was the second rank in demand in healthcare behind dignity. In many countries, it ranked number one. Given the majority of midwives, nurses and cleaners and those utilizing health services are women, the lack of uh, the lack of wash, you know, disproportionately affects women. And we have to understand the global health threats, uh, no, no borders, uh, lack of wash endangers all of us. The crisis is as serious as it is uh, solvable. Uh, and as uh, we know, sustainability is key to success. And, Getting washed into healthcare facilities 
is a no regret investment but uh, we normally forget this and we uh, have uh, other uh, areas uh, of focus and uh, finally i would say that now we have a global movement uh, starting from uh, un general assembly call the who resolution in world health assembly and the hand hygiene for all initiative that was launched by who and unicef uh, these are all uh, initiatives that will definitely keep the momentum towards achieving uh, that 100% of wash in healthcare facilities by 2030. So with this, I will uh, stop at this point because uh, I think it's uh, a long list of things that we can discuss when it comes to uh, the uh, uh, you know scenario and the topic uh, that we have in hand today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Hussain, and, and thank you. I think that you very sharply highlighted that um, that this is very much a part of the right to health and the right to safe and dignified care, uh, and how women um, and newborns are perhaps most disproportionately affected by this. It's a very critical points. We'll also circle back to something that you have noted on the healthcare-associated infections, uh, and, and we'll try and bring that into our, uh, our discussion as well. So thank you for raising that. Um, next, uh, Job, we'd like to hear from you your uh, opening remarks. Uh, Job, you're on mute. Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, sorry, we've lost your voice. We could hear you earlier, but we can't hear you now. Could just give us a couple of minutes uh, while, while Job is able to get his speakers. Thank you for our audience. No, Job, I'm sorry, we still cannot hear you. Um, for the audience, if you could just give us a couple of minutes um, and maybe as we're trying to uh, help Job with this audio issue, we can just quickly go to Dr. Deepak uh, Saxena uh, and if we could hear your opening remarks um, while we try and support you. Thank you, Deepak. Hi, uh, thanks everyone. And uh, Don said I should uh, thank you, Raman, and uh, the colleagues who have uh, you know organized this important event. I have two or three important points, and then I'll take a pause. Um, you had already mentioned about uh, uh, the implications of poor wash and IPC on um, maternal mortality ratio, and and it's true that you know in spite of infusing so much amount of money under an RHM and NHM. Uh, we had or we could really make out high amount of institutional delivery, but still, um, you know, sepsis has come out to be one of the important reasons for uh, enhanced maternal death. And it's an apt time that if we really want to, uh, you know, achieve our SDGs, we should uh, take this up. And uh, you had also mentioned, and I could hear from Dr. Rashti also, and he has also mentioned about neonatal death and infant death, and that can be actually attributed to, uh, you know, the prematurity, which is more prone for infection. But one point which I'd like to uh, really highlight here is that, you know, we have been working in various states across India and even in Bangladesh. One of the observation which we had found was because of poor wash, there is a, a tendency by the healthcare professionals to give antimicrobial agents to all those who, uh, who deliver in the institute. You know, irrespective of type of delivery, whether it's normal or cesarean, uh, giving antimicrobial agents is pretty common and our observation across uh, you know four states in india uh, you know it has actually uh, raised or it had actually increased the incidence of um, antimicrobial resistance also and you know uh, if uh, adequate wash can actually be uh, adhered to there is no need for giving this indiscriminate uh, antimicrobial agents and uh, you know, antimicrobial resistance can be a potential pandemic in future. And, uh, you know, it's silently and slowly moving and it can have a devastating impact on all of us. Uh, we all know that it's multifactorial. It can be because of misuse, overuse, self-medication, prescription practices and so on and so forth. But 
one of the important key point that should be known to almost all of the us who are actually in research or who are in advocacy or who are in policy planning is uh, poor sanitation hygiene and uh, poor infection prevention and control activities as well as overuse and misuse of antimicrobial agents can be a real threat and therefore further to what you have said further to what uh, dr rashti has to add to it uh, my sincere request would be uh, we should look beyond uh, the landscape of wash and uh, of course dignity and other things are very important and ipc uh, we should look at a longish horizon to cover the last mile of antimicrobial agents also um, i'll take a pause here and let's see uh, thank you if job has been able to put his uh, yeah. thank you thank you uh, can we hear you job uh, can you uh, hear yeah. me yes we can yeah yeah thank you so much i think some connectivity problem and uh, i uh, i think there is a huge deficit uh, in the area of uh, attention and awareness uh, at the three levels one is the level of the healthcare acquired infection uh, very less knowledge and awareness second is the the on the area of infection prevention control again there is lack of attention and awareness and third is also the uh, awareness on the wash element in ipc so the i would say that uh, that the three levels we have and when i say the th three levels of awareness and attention it's not only with the professionals the health workforce or people working in the area this awareness is to be also with the public because this is a major issue because in every year in india there is a 22 million women are giving birth so that many babies are born and we have this uh, uh, snc unit where about 350000 babies are going through these are children with lbw and uh, medical complications so they have to be higher level uh, the care have to be given to them so the the issue is so much and if the statistic says that 10 percentage of the patients who get uh, some sort of services in the health facilities have the probability of getting HCAI, then the role of IPC and the role of WASH in IPC is more all the more important. So the, I will come to the other points. I mean, there, there, are, uh, there are issues relating to uh, planning, monitoring, developing capacity, creating awareness, assessment. There are many issues we need to do. All are being done but we need to do in many fold over. Thank you, Job. Um, and I think just, uh, again, I think you've circled back and you've highlighted this issue of healthcare associated infections or HCAI and how that can further compromise uh, the health and well-being of newborns and young and, and young babies. Um, and I think Dr. Deepak, again, a very critical issue that you've highlighted and we will circle back to this. We want to hear how you've been approaching this issue of the use of um, of antimicrobial agents and how this could be uh, contributing towards uh, antimicrobial resistance, which is like a silent pandemic, which uh, may blow up in the future. And what are the steps that we can take uh, towards preventing that? Uh, it also hits, I think, a very uh, raw chord for many women who have given birth and uh, and had no issues and yet have been shot up with uh, antibiotics. I'm one of those. I I I, I remember experiencing that very profoundly. <laughs> Um, so, Raman, I'd like to uh, hear your opening remarks, given your vast experience in healthcare and in WASH. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? All right. So this, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'll try to summarize this, but, you know, there are a lot uh, in my uh, overall, uh, you know, journey so far. So, you know, when I was working for the initial planning for the National Rural Health Mission and also as the member of uh, the task force for the National Urban uh, Health Mission, and, uh, you know, as part of the Human Rights Commission's core advisory for health and, uh, you know, as director of the SHRC in Chhattisgarh, as setting, you know, setting up the SHRC in Jharkhand and also the multi-sectoral approach health to pro, you know, uh, uh, project uh, that I run in Uttar Pradesh uh, and uh, my association with People's Health Movement and uh, Public Health Resource Network. All these uh, are, uh, you know, very important because, you know, one of the issues is that we are... Uh, the, uh, from uh, the time of uh, primary health care, health for all, we are talking about the need of 
integrating all the various aspects of healthcare and uh, run a comprehensive uh, primary healthcare movement. But what is happening is uh, the verticality of things are making this component uh, in, into kind of piecemeal, uh, uh, you know, kind of thing. So that uh, creates a major problem for. Uh, despite, you know, we are aware about the importance of infection prevention, importance of hygiene in the healthcare segment, uh, the, the fulfillment of that, uh, despite we have various, uh, you know, resource provisions and planning and, uh, you know, guidelines and all in place, uh, the problem is that uh, in, in actually achieving uh, the, the healthcare, uh, you know, the hygiene uh, optimization and uh, infection prevention healthcare facilities, it is taking a a uh, lot of uh, governance, uh, you know, kind of issues. So I'll be quickly focusing on some of those uh, to open up. So uh, how do we address this governance and system issues is the kind of interest for me to work on this area. So uh, one thing is that, uh, you know, the uh, from the human resource point of view, from the home, human resource point of view, you know that all the uh, our healthcare facilities uh, in order to reduce the workforce in the healthcare facilities, what we have done is we have integrated the uh, clinical uh, jobs and the uh, management jobs together. So the doctors and nurses are also supposed to handle uh, the administrative process of it. Understanding the technicality is one thing, but ensuring systems for hygiene and infection prevention is a, a slightly different kind of job. If you are asking a practicing doctor or a practicing nurse or a you know other kind of technicians to ensure uh, the the hygiene because you know their focus always can be into the primary uh, uh, focus of uh, their kind of work so this this issue of uh, tasking in the hrh is an issue that i think uh, we need to address and uh, how you know we can ensure that the hospital management uh, you know within that how how do we ensure infection prevention as a you know very clear indicator and the inspection of the facility and all that becomes uh, you know using this indicator so that no one can uh, see this as a underlying issue it should come in as uh, you know one of the so that antimicrobial uh, resistance issues and the futuristic thing that uh, deepak was talking about or, or the issues were the, that were highlighted by job or by rashid all that can be uh, clearly looked at by way of uh, looking at this from a systematic manner second is the gender prioritization in health we, that is also one issue that uh, you know it, within hrh uh, we are totally neglecting the nursing because you know the our medical care historically is centered around physicians uh, and specialists so how can we make the large workforce of women including from the community level uh, community health workers to uh, you know the auxiliary midwives and uh, nurses to uh, the the supervisory staff to the nurses it's a large segment of uh, female uh, dominated uh, you know staffing uh, that is uh, part of our human resources for health so how can we look at uh, you know, the gender aspects of it and ensuring. So one of the things that when I was in Chhattisgarh, one of the plans that, uh, you know, we were trying to do and also was trying to replicate in Jharkhand was how our healthcare facilities can be female friendly, not only from uh, the, the staff point of view, but also from the user perspective, because the maternal health and various other things are happening. So uh, that is another, uh, you know, kind of thing. Then third is the capacity building aspect of the human resource uh, uh, development, I think. Uh, so the state institute of health and Fa family welfare and the district training centers and all that orienting this uh, you know as an critical subject and you know providing uh, necessary training at this point the training in healthcare facility you know health uh, system or the primary health care is a problem because you know we send uh, those people for trainings uh, who are not necessarily uh, prioritized for the service so those service providers are not finding time for uh, getting the training and capacity building those people who are free or not doing the primary kind of work is sent for training to nhw shws or district training center so the who, who are supposed to get uh, you know trained are not getting trained so how to prioritize that so when i was uh, part of the public health resource networks capacity building program in uh, chhattisgarh jharkhand bihar uh, and the northeast and orissa all these states uh, we have uh, you know whenever we prioritize this issue of uh, hygiene and infection prevention as part of uh, hospital and facility management we found that the the people who got trained on that going back to their facilities and attending to these issues so that is something to uh, focus on and finally uh, during the covid uh, you know time uh, the vaccination and various uh, including the uh, 
you know uh, admissions are happening of a large number of patients uh, so there is a different set of infection prevention that is coming and wash again becomes a center of it so water sanitation and hygiene facilities uh, including uh, adequate number of uh, water points drinking water points as you rightly pointed out in your presentation uh, the how to uh, you know make the drinking water provision different from uh, the other uh, kind of water provision is something so this kind of planning so one other thing is to bring in the pu public works department and the rural engineering services department into the know of how to design a healthcare facilities and you know these issues of uh, all this uh, as deepak uh, pointed out where the antimicrobial uh, resistance issues are coming in where the highest uh, uh, levels of infections are coming in so how to design those areas so we have to start from those things i think and finally uh, the hmis to pick up this as an indicator uh, how our management information system picking up uh, wash in healthcare facilities and infection prevention as indicators to regularly monitor and look at and uh, we have to also prepare our that is something job and i have been working uh, when i was uh, you know the, in vinad uh, when the uh, disaster happened and in bihar now happening and in banaras we are seeing a flood all these are affecting our healthcare facilities uh, in those areas as well so how we are looking at uh, you know healthcare facilities from a disaster context as well uh, so that uh, the wash infrastructure uh, can be maintained and the infection and related issues can be uh, saved there as well so one of the experience of water aid i'll end there we have been working with the rogi kalyan samitis so the rogi kalyan samitis uh, you know is one uh, uh, hospital management uh, you know committee uh, we call it in many places so the, it has a funding it has a structure it has a autonomous uh, you know kind of uh, 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 governance arrangement if we can make their annual plan if we can include uh, uh, hospital uh, you know hygiene and the infection prevention wash facilities in their annual action plan and allocate the funds available not only with them uh, from the annual maintenance grant as well uh, so in chatisgarh there is a jeevandeep arrangement that uh, did the accreditation and uh, star rating of the uh, hospitals and uh, healthcare facilities and one one point in time it discontinued unfortunately uh, but you know those kinds of things are to be brought in uh, for uh, ensuring that uh, you know the attention to these issues along with other important and critical things uh, it's not that you know we need to attend only on what and infection prevention these should be integrated into the larger uh, care provision and quality of care and uh, uh, services service delivery supplies medicine and all that so a system oriented approach and system centered approach for infection prevention and control and wash is something uh, that i am interested uh, on and for that i think uh, we need to prioritize both urban and rural facilities urban facilities are uh, really kind of our own work in mohalla clinics uh, uh, or and the basti dawa khanas of hyderabad mohalla clinics in uh, delhi we are finding that the urban facilities are to be you know beyond providing the you know clinic like kind of care it needs to go into providing maternal care and all that so we need to so it's a good opportunity in the urban area i think because it is expanding at this point so how to uh, you know focus on urban and rural equally as well thank you arunbadi okay thanks uh, thanks raman and also um, i think thanks for bringing it back to uh, one something that we want to focus on is on the health systems and how this is a critical uh, part of that you've also highlighted aspects relating um wash and healthcare facilities to emergencies um uh, and, and disaster situations so uh, thank you and we'll circle back to talking about this uh, as well as in um, urban uh, healthcare centers um we're now going to kind of proceed to ask specific questions to some of our speakers based on their work uh, so we're going to again circle back to uh, dr rashid um so um dr rashid see we see that the the who has very clearly put forward the health systems building block but you've also kind of been one of the leaders to look at wash in healthcare uh, in healthcare facilities specifically um it's it's got um specific indicators and attentions through the joint monitoring program um uh, we're looking at it from this sdg lens as well uh, there is the washfit tool that has been developed by who and unicef jointly which is a fantastic kind of comprehensive assessment and planning tool so can you speak a little more about um both the health systems building blocks as as critical for us to look at and invest in wash uh, to strengthen the delivery of care um with a focus of course on hygiene and infection prevention um we'd also like to hear from you 
based on your experiences in the Maldives as well as other countries in the South uh, Asia and the Southeast Asia region that have begun to take action on Washington healthcare facilities. What are those uh, promising practices that, that you have seen and that you'd like to highlight uh, for all of us and for our audience? Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, uh, all the speakers have highlighted the importance of WASH and IPC as the most crucial pillar when it comes to easier and the most cost-effective measures in preventing many infections, uh, especially at healthcare settings. If we look at the health system block, uh, we have to address uh, in a holistic manner uh, covering all the building blocks to ensure uh, good service delivery is, you know, provided to uh, the patients and uh, those who are visiting the healthcare facilities. Uh, now, uh, we have seen in uh, re recently the establishment of hand hygiene stations at uh, 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 healthcare facilities, uh, as well as um, entrance of many public places, including schools and healthcare facilities. Um, even in some uh, private commercial buildings in many countries in the region. Uh, and uh, apart from, uh, you know, I, I think uh, hand hygiene is everyone's business. And because of that, we have to ensure that it's not only I mean, uh, the, the practice, it comes through, you, you know, daily, it becomes a daily habit. So for that, I think uh, we need to have more uh, hand hygiene stations uh, in the public places, including transport, uh, you know, stations, uh, which uh, were not so prominent in the past. Now, the quality and usability adapted to type and number of users uh, have increased in the region, like public health authorities in the region uh, uh, took a leading role and uh, even responsibilities in installing uh, supervision and regularly, uh, you know, refilling those uh, like uh, we have seen uh, private and civil society initiatives uh, to support commodities maintenance and effective use. Uh, these are all on the rise. In some instance, uh, like uh, we have seen use of hand hygiene stations uh, obligatory to ensure repeated hand hygiene outside private homes in some countries, um, private and public health care facilities. Uh, they have established and strengthened hand hygiene improvement um, multimodal programs and rapidly ensuring that uh, minimum procurement of adequate quantities of supplies. Uh, we have seen uh, more refresher trainings embedded into uh, the uh, health service delivery uh, to with focus on IPC and WASH. And we have seen a lot of reminders, communications and guidance uh, that have been com uh, increased uh, compared to the past. Um, uh, I mean, these are all uh, good things that we see. And local authorities are also ensuring continuous presence of stations uh, for all healthcare workers at point of care uh, for patients, visitors, family members by uh, toilet and in public areas. And I think healthcare workers perform hand hygiene using proper techniques uh, was highlighted in the uh, my five moment, uh, moments for hand hygiene and uh, many healthcare facilities participate actively in uh, WHO Save Lives, Clean Your Hands campaign on May 5th. And then the global hand hygiene for all a global campaign was launched by WHO and UNICEF. You rightly mentioned about the importance of wash fit, which has been uh, part of uh, integrated part. And in CRO, we are uh, right now uh, do, uh, about to finalize a dashboard where you can see uh, the progress of countries in terms of the eight practical steps. And we uh, we have done uh, very recently completed an assessment of washing healthcare facilities in our region, covering all uh, 11 countries in the region. Uh, we, uh, we are now in the stage of validating the data and hopefully we'll have some positive impacts of uh, recent, uh, you know, um, initiatives. And now, the other thing that I would like to say is um, uh, is because of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, our efforts and focus now has to be, of course, to sustain and accelerate these initiatives uh, to ensure that no one is uh, left behind. 
Uh, we are, of course, working on uh, developing a regional program to accelerate our efforts of reaching 100% of wash in healthcare facilities by 2030 targets and ensuring the SDG targets uh, for uh, wash. So I think, uh, in, in a nutshell, if we look at the uh, progress, yes, we, uh, it was a, uh, we, we could say that it was a, a window of opportunity uh, for us with the uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, so the momentum is there now. Uh, it's for us to ensure, uh, you know, we sustain and accelerate our efforts and investments that have taken uh, in uh, into wash areas uh, in, in recently. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rashid. Um, so, uh, Job, I want to move to you. Um, so UNICEF is known for strong support to the government of India on various aspects uh, related to health, nutrition, and WASH. Um, in the past few years, since 2015, you've been actively working with government across states and at the national level on the Kaya Cup guidelines, as well as the Luxury guidelines, which is the labor room improvement quality uh, guidelines. So these are very critical if we're looking at um, you know, improved um, safety and quality of services in healthcare facilities. So we want to hear from you <coughs> as to what's the kind of work that you've done with state governments, with the national government uh, on taking aspects of hygiene, IPC um, forward, what's working well. Um, just also would like to see if you can comment a little more on these health and wellness centers that are coming up and can hygiene be strongly incorporated within its ambit given the goal of these health and wellness centers? Uh, thank you, Arindadi. I'm clear. Yes, you are. We can hear you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, UNICEF uh, is dealing uh, with this IPC in a much more comprehensive way. So uh, within UNICEF, uh, although we use two lens, one is the wash lens and the medical lens. So there are certain things we do in the, from the health department, health section of our UNICEF, which involves uh, microbial surveillance. Uh, for example, in Chhattisgarh, every day, hundreds of samples from the children of S infants who are in the SNCUs. This is the entire thing. They are testing and the reporting and the medical advice. It's happening every day, daily basis. Samples are coming by buses to the testing centers and the so. And also, this applies to the labor room. But that is one aspect of the health work. But I would like to talk about the entire range of work we are doing. One area which we are doing is regarding the health facility assessment. So we are doing uh, most of the in Chhattisgarh, or I mean, this is happening all over India. We do the health facility assessment, which has a strong element of uh, wash in IPC. That's one area. Second area which we are working in the IPC is the training of the uh, health uh, facility workforce. And third area is in the planning, monitoring, and budgeting. Why I said budgeting, it's very important that you influence the governmental system when the NHM PAPs are prepared. This has to be embedded. Otherwise, this is going to be forgotten. So we are there at the planning stage of the PAPs of the state health department. So this IPC elements and the hygiene elements are also included in it. And the another area where we are working in a maybe fourth area is on the awareness on the and the behavioral change. I said in the beginning, there is an awareness deficit, attention deficit in this area. Uh, so this is not, I mean, we need to take to the general public. So the people who come to the these facilities are also aware about what's the importance of this. And uh, the uh, the other area is you know, on the hand hygiene area. We are not only in this all these areas, whether which I mentioned as health facility assessment, microbial surveillance in SNCU and labor room, training of health force workforce, planning, monitoring, budgeting, awareness creation. Uh, apart from that, I mean uh, we are also uh, demonstrating it. And for example, in two aspirational districts in Chhattisgarh. Uh, in all the health facilities, we are supporting the insurance. Uh, we are ensuring the wash compliance in the IPC in the, all the health facilities. So we do uh, not only just at the state level help in the assessment, training, monitoring, planning. 
we also go down to the lower level and help to demonstrate these things these are happening and another area which i mean i didn't hear uh, anybody speaking much is another area which is a related area with respect to ipc is the waste management and the biomedical waste management that's also another area where we are uh, working so we are in a multiple areas we are working but what i feel is i mean if we want to get a major results in it the attention of the policy makers the politicians the mlas mps on this area of which i mentioned this three area three uh, three areas of uh, hcai ipc and the importance of course wash is one element of it even the medical aspect of it uh, that awareness creation uh, and then only we will be able to advocate and then only we will be able to get more funds for it and then only we will be able to ensure all these areas over and as you said in the health and wellness centers uh, yes. we are also working ensuring i mean at least we are in two districts uh, dandewada and uh, bijapur these are all i um, mean the lwe affected the worst districts in chatisgarh and probably in india so we are ensuring not only we are talking some theory and capacity building and the, the, the higher level in the paper uh, we are also at the ground level making this happening and we also support i mean when we do a health facility assessment where it has got the wash element we also follow up and ensure those uh, points in the assessment are being done so it's not that one time assessment and you forget about it is followed up and we have consultants and you know, for example in the wash and health in chatisgarh itself we have got about 40 45 consultants they are all following up on all this uh, all these areas thank you great thanks job i think very in very practical terms you've been able to tie together all the health system aspects for us you know you've talked about training and capacity building of cadres of healthcare providers but also creating awareness uh, among the patient community you've talked about planning monitoring financing um, and of course uh, all important behavior change um, thanks for highlighting the issue of biomedical waste management i think we'll uh, we'll uh, hopefully we'll have time to circle back to hear a little more about that and how that connects uh with this uh, with this issue um so we're going to now hear a little bit from dr deepak um so dr deepak i mean through your work for for a number of years you've been using both research as well as innovations to tackle this issue of infection prevention and control and hygiene in healthcare settings so can you tell us a little about you know how you've done your research because you've also approached it uh using multiple um multiple methods multiple tools and you've implemented innovations in india and bangladesh other countries um so can we hear from you about these uh hi thanks arundhati um i'm sure i'm audible to you yeah thank you uh so you know um, it almost started a decade back when uh, we were looking and triangulating the reasons of non decline of maternal death in spite of nrhm making huge inroads and huge funding and we came across one of the papers from uh, professor wendy graham from lshtm and that actually highlighted that sepsis is one of the important causes and we were looking at the determinants of ipc and wash practices and we did a landscape where we came to know in fact published literature suggested that you know there are certain uh, you know determinants of ipc practices and wash practices there are contextual factors such as infrastructure hr available materials policies practices and more than that there are individual factors which are knowledge attitude belief status which actually leads to behavior and motivation and finally it leads to what is known as an optimal wash but beyond that you know it is also important that visibly safe safe or visibly clean might not be uh, microbiologically safe and i'm happy to uh, listen to job uh, that you know chatisgarh is doing all this innovation but almost 9 years back we applied for a grant for developing a toolbox toolbox to assess uh, wash in healthcare facility and go for an assessment of ipc and we were fortunate to get that grant and we did this in india and bangladesh and that toolbox was presented to all policy planners and you know majority of the states and um, although they were very uh, positive about this approach but we faced a lot and lots of criticism that you know it talks only about labor room 
uh, you should go beyond it and it talks only about rural healthcare facility you should go beyond rural healthcare facility and we developed toolbox version 2 uh, where we did a multi centric study in four states on urban area and of course uh, beyond labor room and you know um, everything went very fine and then we were again criticized that uh, you know just assessing will not do anything you need to improve uh, and you need to suggest us that you know what can be done next and we went for toolbox plus and which actually had five modules which actually was uh, done along with um, who southeast asia and share and we developed these modules and once we had developed these modules we are ready to demonstrate it and we did this interventional trial in gujarat uh, in 20 healthcare facility uh, along with support from center of environmental health and we actually demonstrated that you know optimal wash is an important thing and it can lead to larger dividends with reference to use of antimicrobial agents with reference to use of um, you know even documenting the postnatal care which is always criticized in india and uh, then we had again a criticism that you know what next and we when we were looking for the answers for what next we got an opportunity from unicef assam where we not only went for the training we not only went for what is known as um, a, a complete plan of assessment intervention and also we incorporated what was required uh, to be at that time very important was costed improvement plan and we not only did this, but along with assessment, we also suggested the state government, along with the support of UNICEF, that, you know, if at all you want to make this uh, healthcare facility wash compliant, what is important is you should know that what amount of budget is required. And then came, uh, you know, we did all this costed in improvement plan and then came this COVID-19. And luckily we are now in um, in consultation with the uh, jobs team in uh, Chhattisgarh, where we really wanted to ensure that we have now developed WASH uh, Q, which really uh, has a weighted score for, it can give weighted score for each of the healthcare facility. And rather than going for all care health, healthcare facility in one go, uh, you know, it should be a stepwise process whereby in first step you can identify which are the low hanging fruits where you can go for a much better implementation. So rather than because this, what I have seen in Gujarat is, you know, I don't know why colleagues in Gujarat uh, from the state government are more interested in doing trainings. And when we talk about beyond training, they are least bothered. They say, you know, the fund is available only for training. But, you know, when we talk about WASH training, what I have observed is we, we, we give a lot of training to medical officers. We give a lot of training to nurses. But, you know, our observation was, one of the important stakeholders is moppers, cleaners. They require handholding and, you know, they require that motivation. There are cast dynamics. There are, you know, n number of dynamics which actually restrict them for doing their optimal work. And it is important that uh, they should actually be uh, engaged into. And, uh, you know, there are so many challenges, recruitment challenges, contract appointment, social stigma and so on and so forth. So our argument to the state was, uh, you know, they should all be on one platform if you really want to take this to the next level of IPC and making it wash compliant. Uh, you know, our observation said that in at least in four states that, you know, facility head, they don't really perceive it to be so important. And hence, there is very less budget allocation. And many a times IPC committees works only on paper. And, you know, uh, every month, uh, PHC have a monthly monitoring review. However, you know, WASH or IPC is not even talked about or discussed about. And therefore, we uh, we strongly advocated to the state and uh, thankfully uh, to the government of Gujarat that at least after four or five years of our continuous effort, we could ensure that the state government had um, ensured uh, that sending some letter and some instructions to all district that in each monthly meeting, there should be integration and convergence of uh, other activities along with the Bosch and IPC activities. So, you know, uh, our understanding uh, is something that, you know, it's a long way and, you know, small steps uh, is uh, important and um, four or five important things that needs to be done. For sure, we should go for assessment. Number two, we should develop the capacities right from the leader of the healthcare facility to the most grounded person, uh, say for cleaner or mopper. Uh, we should have some uh, dedicated budget and we should have implemented target plans. And more than that, uh, I'm, I'm thankful to Job for uh, 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 telling this. We need to have a monitoring and review process. 
and then only you know you can integrate uh, water sanitation hygiene in routine healthcare sector planning budgeting and programming um i take a pause here uh, thank you very much thanks uh, dr deepak and i'm going to pick up two points uh, which you uh, talked about um and and pose those questions to raman so raman i mean um, dr deepak said that we've got you've got cadres of healthcare workers and those who are engaged in the health system um but we often focus on the doctors as being the primary medical service providers but we have a huge cadre of nurses and um allied health workers and as dr deepak said you have sanitation workers cleaners mopers who play such a critical role in healthcare facilities um so given your own work you mentioned this concept of you know having a very gendered healthcare uh work workforce and how we are paying less attention to the women workforce in healthcare facilities and your own work with sanitation workers so i i'd like to ask you that how can we provide greater support to them we do know from research very interestingly that nurses tend to engage in much higher levels of hand hygiene much better infection prevention control practices than uh, doctors we th there is global research as well as research from LS lmics that show this but yet we don't give this workforce enough attention and as 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 dr deepak has pointed out our lowest cadre of workers in a healthcare facility they receive very little support training and budgetary allocation so i'd like to hear your comments on that um and lastly is this whole point that both job and dr deepak have highlighted on the um on the role of ipc committee on the role of planning monitoring budgetary allocations and given your work with rogi kalyan samiti how can we strengthen them how can we make sure that these committees exist are active and are playing a you know a catalytic role uh, in in um, bringing about this change that we need to see so i know two big questions for you um, but, but um, you can choose to pick up one and, and then we can circle back all right so i'll try to because you know all these questions are something that i have uh, you know thought about uh, speaking as well so uh, Uh, and when uh, job was talking about he mentioned about the biomedical waste management which is ha having a lot of important connection with uh, sanitation workers as well uh, so i'll i'll pick up uh, you know the <clears throat> first question first the uh, but the point that you made about uh, you know the uh, gender uh, issue so even in the old uh, somerville's experiment one of his important observation was that uh you know the 1857 story i'm talking about uh, uh the the important observation was that the midwives were able to maintain better hygiene uh, compared to the medical practitioners so it starts from there i mean not only the 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 uh, new uh, you know kind of kind of finding that we are talking about so it is really i mean as uh, deepak uh, importantly pointed out and others also uh, told the the investment on uh, you know uh, the nurses uh, the allied health professionals and importantly when it comes to you know the hygiene of the uh, facility uh, the sanitation workers and the cleaning staff uh, you know makes a lot of uh, important contributions and how we see this uh, you know in a hospital so if you see the uh, organogram of a health facility uh, so one of the things that in korba uh, uh, i uh, i was uh, trying to make the uh, district hospital korba uh, you know at that time we didn't have uh, nabl uh, you know accreditation started for the government facility the uh, the, the definitions were coming in uh, so we were trying to do uh, what you call the <clears throat> uh, uh, iso certification of the uh, district hospital so the uh, uh, some of the things that we could do with the iso at that time uh, was that you know we could in include sanitation workers in that uh, you know segment uh, so the sanitation workers uh, you know became important uh, uh, you know functionaries within the organogram of the hospital so every uh, you know uh, aspect of thing so uh, generally what uh, we do is uh, you know after the nursing staff ward boys or uh, ayas onwards we think you know some contractual staff with some basic training will do and that is what the healthcare understanding of uh, human resource uh, planners at the top level because you know quite often the uh, the, the department uh, human resource section uh, establishment they call it 
the establishment sections are run by uh, you know some uh, uh, lower division or upper division clerks not necessarily people having understanding of public health systems or the the, the human resources of for health or the functions essential functions of uh, healthcare delivery so how would you uh, you know uh, look at the uh, you know the 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 most uh, the frontline workers are the most important kind of asset of any department it's an understanding that uh, slowly it is developing now i mean we are hearing the word frontline workers over the last couple of years particularly because of covid uh, sometimes you know we need to thank the pandemics uh, for highlighting some of the uh, you know very important aspects uh, uh, so uh, although you know the the, the problems that the pandemics create, the challenges that the pandemic creates are very high. Uh, so it is, uh, uh, you know, th th this aspect of frontline workers uh, was not coming into the picture. And then the nurses, as you, uh, you know, the leadership of healthcare departments itself is a example. You know, we cannot think of uh, a, uh, a nurse heading the healthcare delivery uh, services. We will be thinking all the time about whether it's a director, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, commissioner and secretary, uh, those kinds of positions are uh, these days uh, very clearly, uh, you know, going to the administrative services. I'm not talking about that, but the technical services, if you look at uh, fr from center to uh, the uh, states to, uh, you know, the districts to, uh, we will be rarely seeing any of those uh, positions, even with uh, higher kind of experiences and seniority, uh, these uh, cadres will stop at a particular point. So, I mean, there are several issues. So how can we, uh, when it comes to a hospital administrator, uh, you know, uh, how can we look at, uh, you know, the uh, the most important cadres, you know, there is a prom promotion avenue for them to lead the healthcare facility. So those kinds of issues uh, in the uh, universal health coverage, there was a high level expert group to which I was a technical advisor on some of these aspects, urban health, uh, community participation and also human resources for health. So in that, uh, I was trying to, uh, you know, push this idea and that was accepted as well to, uh, you know, a large extent that, you know, the promotional avenues for, for the uh, cadres are important. But more importantly here, uh, the training and uh, the kind of leadership roles uh, for, uh, you know, the uh, largest, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, human resources or workforce is something uh, quite important. Second part is about the IPC committee. The IPC committee, uh, the, the this is what I was talking about the verticality uh, in my previous comment. <clears throat> Unless and until, uh, see the quality of care is uh, currently seen as a uh, separate segment. Why the quality of care was introduced in India is also something very interesting because uh, uh, in 2000, I was also part of a, uh, a jury of the Human Rights Commission, which was looking at, uh, uh, you know, some of the maternal health care delivery. Uh, and there was a public hearing uh, held by the National Human Rights Commission. And the public hearing, uh, you know, uh, then the uh, there was an action point. Uh, and similarly, there was a court order. There was an action point from the court order. So this uh, complaints to the court order quite often pushes some of this agenda. So, uh, you know, the legal uh, side of, uh, you know, uh, adv advocacy action sometimes delivers some of this agenda. But not necessarily uh, it is uh, seen as an integrated part of the whole healthcare service delivery. So this aspect, how can we integrate into uh, the the you know the horizontalize or diagonal uh, you know uh, <clears throat> diagonalize this into a uh, uh, you know uh, uh, healthcare delivery larger infrastructure and uh, uh, make it into a comprehensive one then uh, you know uh, what all are the key functions of a hospital within that we place the uh, IPC committee not as a meeting done I mean the indicator quite often that is the problem also Deepak was indicating that you know it's only uh, happening on paper because the indicator is number of meetings done indicator is not uh, number of uh, you know problems found and actions taken on them see the the, the indicators are quite often uh, in determining uh, this issue. So, uh, we, uh, whosoever is working in the uh, health sector uh, at the academic level, at the action level, at the advisory and, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the technical support level has to understand that the, uh, the kind of indicator that we pick up for monitoring and the questions that is asked in the review meetings, these kinds of things are to be shaped in a manner that they, they are action oriented, uh, not just, uh, you know, quantitatively uh, number oriented. 
so uh, uh, this is something uh, in across the world we can see that wherever the indicator is picking up uh, a action that is a tick boxing kind of a one uh, so you can easily uh, you know surpass it and uh, uh, make it uh, you know we have done it so th so this this uh, notion of uh, fulfilling the administrative requirement should change into the notion of uh, fulfilling the actual service delivery uh, needs. Uh, you know, then you know the IPC committees will change. So the IPC committees in India also the Kayakalp is related to that. If you see the Kayakalp indicators, uh, uh, you know when the Swachh Bharat Mission comes in, the Kayakalp uh, uh, was introduced from the visible. Uh, again, uh, Deepak was pointing it out. Uh, the visible cleanliness ne does not necessarily, uh, you know, equate to. Uh, the actual hygiene of a healthcare facility. So the indicators needs to be, uh, as uh, Job was saying, the uh, number of uh, tests done, uh, laboratory tests done, are uh, done, and uh, you know also the, the related issues of something that I was reading from Indore, uh, that uh, the private health facilities. We didn't discuss much about the private health facilities here. We are mostly talking about the uh, public health care uh, care facility. So the private health care facilities. Uh, you know, pushing antimicrobial waste into the uh, surface water is a major issue that was found by uh, the antimicrobial uh, resistance campaign. Uh, so they were uh, so finding it and, you know, the sorting it out is going to be because, you know, many of our current uh, uh, water treatment processes are not equipped to look at uh, antimicrobial uh, waste. So, you know, those kinds of issues are there. So we need to see uh, the infection prevention uh, from a very, uh, you know, the, the human impact perspective and indicators should address uh, those perspectives is the question there. And coming to the Rogi Kalyan Samiti uh, issue, the Rogi Kalyan Samiti currently, you know, the for administrative easiness, many of the Rogi Kalyan Samitis are uh, run and manage the membership and most of it is are the same administrators who are having a role within that hospital. So there is a conflict of interest to uh, see the, uh, you know, actual problems in that facility because I myself is the secretary of the Rogi Kalyan Samiti and I myself is the chief of that uh, uh, healthcare facility. So how will I see the problems there and try to address it? It's an issue. So we need to have and also the community participation in many of the Rogi Kalyan Samitis are based on uh, contributions or nominations by people's representatives, the actual uh, interested people uh, who are actually wanting to change the healthcare scenario in their locality, how to bring some of them into that and then their dynamic contributions are making Rogi Kalyan Samiti planning and uh, Rogi Kalyan Samiti understanding. So uh, there should be some ways of bringing in the civil society element and so the, there was something called community-based monitoring uh, in the National uh, Rural Health Mission. That community-based monitoring can be something uh, strengthened for this purpose for uh, looking at the healthcare facilities, uh, you know, the indicators set for that and then they are contributing into the planning and then they are adding these elements of whatever is missing element into uh, the planning of uh, the facility. So these are the things. And finally, coming to the biomedical waste management and uh, uh, sanitation uh, workers. The, uh, we were recently looking at a study how the uh, during the COVID the sanitation workers are doing. Uh, so we discussed with 15 uh, qualitative interviews with 15 uh, uh, hospital sanitation workers and found that only three of them uh, could get, uh, you know, the adequate kind of uh, personal protection equipments and, you know, related, related uh, guidance and all that. And they were, uh, uh, you know, going back to their, uh, you know, the places they were stay, staying are slums. And, you know, they are going to those places in the crowded environment they are leaving and coming back. And the the kind of possibility of spread and also uh, the attention to this uh, uh, the cadre of workers sanitation workers needs to be needs a tremendous in improvement in the healthcare facility sector so we need to prioritize them we need to train them we need to uh, dignify their work we need to kind of bring them into the understanding of some of these issues what all are the uh, impacts and you know effects of what they are doing so we need to really attend the sanitation worker cadre and the biomedical waste management how are we doing it Again, I pointed out to that uh, water, uh, you know, kind of uh, issue, uh, how antimicrobial uh, resist, I mean, uh, waste is uh, mixing up with the water in many, uh, you know, surface water bodies. Uh, so these kinds of issues are to be looked at and biomedical waste management needs to be prioritized. In Kerala, there is a model, it has its own flows. Uh, I know that the Indian Medical Association in Kerala has put together a biomedical waste management plant and they collect from all private and private uh, public healthcare facilities biomedical waste and take it to a centralized treatment plant. But it is in a 
uh, forest area uh, in the in kerala tamil nadu border of uh, uh, you know palakkad district uh, there are some flows uh, uh, you know that people are saying that the cent- the plant is not run uh, in the way it should be uh, but however that is the accreditation body and regulation bodies need to look at those issues but however we need to have arrangements of that sort uh in all states uh, to collect uh, biomedical waste and not to let it uh, uh, you know uh, the, the, the the more you know, these kinds of things unless you have proper systems and understanding about managing these waste uh, the decentralized systems cannot probably uh, you know support it well even if we are doing so de- decentralized system that is uh, desirable because of the local governments and panchayat raj institutions can play a major role in that but on the other hand we need to have sufficient technical understanding of uh, know how of how to manage uh, these centers uh, you know in in a larger level so we need to have uh, you know biomedical waste management as a major agenda in the upcoming days otherwise all these are going to lead to uh, major problems of uh, you know uh, non curability of several things within our healthcare facilities if we are looking for uh, cure within healthcare facilities we need to care the healthcare facilities thank you great last point uh, raman um so uh, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left in our session and just as we want to hear some of your closing remarks i'd also like to ask our audience if you do have any questions please do post it in the q and a box i see there are some questions already but many of them have already been answered um by our panelists now as we move towards the end of today's session i want to kind of go back and highlight some of the key issues and key points that have been raised by our panelists um one is that um that this is very much an issue of a human right to health uh, and the whole concept of um safe and dignified care is placed very central when we look at hygiene and infection and prevention and control and it's something that we must keep uh, central to this work um we've also do not directly discuss this it's immersed through all the discussions that um when we look at hygiene when we look at inf- infection prevention and control this is very much about um taking a disease prevention health promotion lens and not just a treatment lens and again this is what the indian healthcare system was uh, traditionally or initially built on uh, that our primary healthcare should be focused on making sure that people have good health and how can we keep ourselves illness or disease free and not simply resort to healthcare facilities only for treatment so again that how does this provide us that opportunity to reinforce um the disease prevention health promotion component um we also have seen that hygiene infection prevention it's a behavioral issue uh, it's a health systems issue and within this we've seen very important points that we need to take kind of collaborative joint action on assessments monitoring planning and budgeting training of cadres of healthcare providers um we need to have approaches innovations which are looking at awareness behavior change continued support and all this within the system strengthening a uh, system strengthening model um we also need to keep our eyes on how our current actions in healthcare facilities may fuel future problems whether that's related to emergencies the issue of antimicrobial resistance which is growing in india and in other countries um something that we need to consider one point that has been has been raised by all our panelists is a critical engagement of the community within the healthcare setup so how can we bring them in whether it's community based monitoring engagement awareness um as rights of as as patients but also holding the health system accountable to the services and the quality services that they need to be providing our community members this is also been highlighted um we want to end by hearing your closing remarks on whether you think that the current covid pandemic has helped to catalyze action on hygiene and infection prevention as a um health uh, promotion and a disease prevention kind of uh, has helped kind of bring focus back to health promotion and disease prevention or is it still steering our health system towards the treatment mode um so just some closing remarks on whether the covid pandemic has provided us an opportunity to kind of spin our thinking and go back to what health for all and our primary health care was really established for um over to i think uh, dr rashid will start with you 
uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, we, I think there's no uh, uh, doubt or debate on the fact that uh, infection prevention and control principles and procedures um, for uh, with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has come to the limelight. Um, you know, we see that uh, WHO, uh, UNICEF uh, guidance and recommendations that came up at different stages. And as I earlier mentioned, uh, with the momentum of, uh, uh, you know, the global uh, call for hand hygiene for all and the importance that has been given has certainly put uh, uh, the whole agenda of uh, IPC wash and AMR issues on to the, uh, you know, center of attention when we strive to achieve universal health coverage. And I would say uh, uh, it, it covers, you know, preparation and planning phase sections that are needed, what should be considered in the, you know, operational phase. And uh, this has been discussed by different speakers in uh, detail, so I will not go into detail. I would say that uh, as a final word that uh, yes, uh, it's very critical, it's a fundamental right. Every person needs and deserves access to safe and dignified health care, uh, need to have inclusive approaches, uh, gender, disability, and all vulnerable groups need to be inclusive and no one has to be uh, left behind. And uh, we need enough investments and efforts to ensure behavior change. And uh, this is being given a priority. Uh, and that's the only way we can achieve our, uh, you know, targets of, of wash in healthcare facilities by 2030, covering 100%. So with that, I will give the floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rashid. Um, Job, uh, we'd like to hear your closing thoughts. Yeah, uh, certainly. I think COVID is a positive spin-off of COVID. I mean, of course, it's a costly that there has been uh, a positive, uh, uh, more positive behaviors uh, we see not only in the health facility, but also where our schools and anganwadis uh, and public homes, uh, of, uh, we are yet to have a empirical evidence on it, but whatever we have among the anecdotal and whatever the important, for example, in Chhattisgarh, the state government is asking before opening schools, what are the wash facilities? What are the wash precautions we have to take? I mean, this is never heard. I mean, normally they don't do, I mean, issue a guideline when before opening a school or an Anganwadi. So more awareness have happened on hand hygiene and it has happened also in the health facilities. So it's a all around uh, the, uh, improvement on the awareness. For years together, we have been talking about uh, hand washing uh, on hand hygiene on October 15. What was not achieved in 50 years, what UNICEF and other agencies were celebrating on hand washing. The COVID, of course, is a, again, I said, is a very expensive, it's a very costly, but that we could achieve by COVID. So that awareness are there. Only, uh, only issue is we need to continue with this increased practice. Thank you. Thank you, Job. Um, Dr. Deepak, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Sarandati. And you know, I do agree with um, uh, you know, Job and Dr. Rishti also. Um, you know, it has given a huge amount of impetus for uh, you know hygiene, sanitation, washing, healthcare facility, and IPC. And we are just conducting and we have just concluded one case control study on mucormycosis. And one of the important risk factors that has emerged out to be, you know, use of oxygen, that is industrial, non-industrial, or number of antimicrobial agents that were used. So for that matter of fact, it is very important for all of us to, you know, actually uh, capitalize, and I should not use the word capitalize on COVID scenario, but yes, it gives us an opportunity to look beyond and, you know, beyond hand hygiene also. Uh, I agree with Job that for 50 years we have been doing this and in one go we could really, uh, COVID has changed the entire world. But we we should look beyond healthcare facility, ICDS schemes, Anganwadi centers, schools, geriatric homes, uh, and so on and so forth. So I too agree that, you know, uh, we should work more coherently, uh, converge our efforts and uh, took this as an opportunity. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you, Dr. Deepak. Uh, Raman, for your closing thoughts. Yeah. So uh, all strengths that has been highlighted by uh, all the you know uh, esteemed panelists here, 
one thing i find in the covid context is that all the you know kind of measures that we have put in place are uh, short term or at the maximum medium term <clears throat> so one of the uh, you know issues is that uh, all the kind of protection systems that we are talking about are mainly individual centric not or you know family centric or uh, you know institution centric not necessarily it is going into uh, a system centric uh, kind of approach so uh, how to uh, you know make this uh, you know whatever attainment has been done during this uh, time for the specific uh, you know uh, immediate cause of the pandemic how can we make a long term uh, kind of achievement from this uh, in terms of uh, systems for future in terms of patients rights to protection patients rights to uh, you know patients when i say all the marginalized the, all the you know underprivileged all those you know patients patients rights to uh, protection and patients rights to wash patients rights to uh, you know uh, duties also uh, of the protective behaviors and uh, finally embedded with the workers rights particularly the frontliners uh, this is something that uh, we should be looking forward uh, from the current achievements of the uh, uh, short term and immediate uh, measures to a long term and sustainable uh, you know uh, that will fulfill maybe by 2030 uh, all sustainable development uh, you know uh, goals around the healthcare facilities and patients rights thank you great um and with this we will bring our session to a close so thank you very much uh, to dr rashid um to dr deepak uh, job and to raman for being a fantastic panel for highlighting the length and breadth of these issues from a behavioral as well as from a systems perspective thank you and thank you all to our audience as well um for being so engaged in this discussion and last but not the least we'd also like to thank the charja 2021 and the nash foundation um for hosting such a an important session um have a good afternoon everyone and stay safe thank you thank you thank you